I was working on my computer, mostly reading emails, when the email appeared on the computer, and I assumed it was Bank of America that I was responding to. It looked very authentic, and uh, it began by asking several questions, which were rather innocuous, but soon it began asking questions that I thought they already should have known. This is a call comes very often for years that they're going to charge me such and such if I do not pay up anywhere from $200 up for a computer repair and they give a telephone number that's a fake. It's a company that has nothing to do with computer repair. It's absolutely a fake. So, um, as, as you heard, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for a long time. Today is my 12th anniversary at Benchmark, so I've been in senior living for 12 years. And, and so this, this is a very personal story. Um, when my parents started aging, uh, those are hard conversations to have. My parents were very independent, traveled internationally, avid skiers, hikers, mm -hmm. did not want us getting in their business. So at a point when they were in their mid-80s, we had to have the conversation. And my sister and I spent a lot of time thinking about this. And we did sit down with them on two Saturdays. The husbands were excluded, the outlaws, only the family. And we sat and talked about their assets so that we could understand what their financial picture looked like. We made sure we had signed copies of power of attorney, health care proxy, HIPAA forms, electronic copies as well as hard copies and I just if I tell you nothing else just making sure you have those for your family members both electronic and hard copy I can't tell you how many times as my parents have aged I have needed those forms to prove who I am so that was something that we did right and and um, so as my parents started to age for us it happened very quickly at the, at, when they were in their late 80s, early 90s. Suddenly, uh, we were at that point where there was significant cognitive decline. We began to take over the bills when we saw um, invoices and late payments in very unusual places in the house where you wouldn't expect to see bills. We took over all of the bill payments. So we thought we had total visibility and we had it all taken care of. We found a caregiver, uh, a, a gentleman about 40 years old, and it clicked. My mom was still out driving around because nobody, I couldn't take the car away from her even though that's a whole nother subject, but she was out there being independent. My dad at least had somebody to work with him on his slides and um, put together slides, um, take his digitized his slides, put together slideshows on his Apple computer, but my dad had full-on dementia at this point. Fast forward, my mom got very sick in 2017, so you pay attention as caregivers to the one who needs the most physical care. My parents brought, we brought in 24-7 care for my parents, but Kevin, the caregiver who we had started with, was always my parents' favorite. He was the one, he was the lead caregiver. He brought my parents up to New Hampshire some weekends to their ski house. He actually took my parents on a one-week cruise to Canada, my mom's last wish. I mean, he was a great caregiver. When I opened that credit check, there were 13 credit cards that had been opened starting one month after that caregiver had come to work for us until the time that I had looked, there, there, had, there were $85,000 of charges, and I won't even go into what those charges were for. They were not need-based charges, let's just say. And there was another 100, 120000 of available credit that I fortunately stopped. Uh, my grandmother, Brooke Astor, was a New York City philanthropist who spent uh, 40 years uh, as a senior uh, 
as president of the Vincent Astor Foundation. And what happened is she was a victim of abuse. And desperately trying to help my grandmother, I didn't know what to do. I talked to several trusted people, including a sage high school friend whose family had been through similar circumstances. He advised, Philip, follow your heart first, then follow the money. <laughs> Our greatest concern was my grandmother's psychological abuse, a form of elder abuse that's really difficult to substantiate and document and assess. So initially, I felt that financials were the fallback. <coughs> I now know that financials are at the forefront and that the financial industry, regulators, and not-for-profits are taking a key leadership role in protecting seniors' net worth, self-worth, and lives. It's true uh, there, you know, that that case did involve a good amount of money, but and some people thought, oh, that's one of the reasons they took that case. We had cases involving, you know, couple hundred dollars, couple thousand dollars, tens of thousands, and, and millions. But the cases all did have similar themes, Sally. Um, maybe not that much money, maybe not celebrity witnesses like in the Astor case, but really common themes on all, on all the cases, basically. And some of those themes are um, these exploitation cases go on for a very long time before they're identified. And sometimes, usually not for days or weeks, usually for months, oftentimes for years. I'm sure you've read about some before they're identified either within the financial institution or by a victim, but often not because that's why victims are targeted is they may not be on top of their finances, older and younger victims, right? Um, or by a caregiver like a family member. You know, you were great. You discovered it on your own. You were savvy. You had good guidance but they go on for a long time, which is one of the reasons why I left the DA's office, is I really wanted to work on prevention. That's what I work on now at Eversafe. Other things they had in common, lots of them involved victims who had some form of impairment. Maybe not a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, the big scare now, as Surya said, right? I feel like Alzheimer's is the new C, C word. It used to be cancer, but they have found some cures, and now no one wants to mention Alzheimer's, when really that's just one form of dementia. There are many different forms. But that was another thing that the cases had in common, is the scammers are really good, whether it's a family member or a stranger, at the people they know to target is usually someone, not who's completely out of it, but someone out of it. Someone who can make a deal or sign a codicil, like Mrs. Astor, but who suffers from impairment so that they don't quite know what's going on. Other things the cases have in common, they're devastating. Okay, so there's some lack of monitoring, I have to admit, within financial institutions. There, you know, financial institutions are in a tough spot. Scammers aren't just going to steal $100,000 from B of A. They're smart. They fly under the radar. They're usually stealing across accounts, across institutions, right? Use a few credit cards, maybe open up a new credit card and affect their credit report data, and yet people and caregivers, victims and caregivers, are looking across accounts and across institutions. But probably the biggest thing on all of these cases, and this is really important, because I know you're thinking it out there, and I've seen this, you know, my unit had 800 prosecutions a year. Not just investigations, prosecutions. No one thinks they're gonna be a victim. The other big scams are the tech fraud scam. You know, there's a virus, something that pops up on your computer, there's malware on your computer, click here and we'll fix it. Yeah, that happens all the time. Uh, other big scams right now are the sweetheart scam. A lot of lonely people out there, older and younger, who are out there trying to find friendship or love, even in their later years. So the, the IRS scam, also huge. And something that won't be picked up, by the way, by credit monitoring. Because scammers who try to get a refund in your name, and they're not you, and it's fake refund, how do you think they do that? They don't do that by opening up a credit-based account. Won't show up in your credit report. It'll show up in a fake depository account in your name. 
Um, so in Cyberland, there is no good news here. Let's be clear. This, this will depress you very quickly. Uh, and you know, it, that's one of the reasons we're spending so much money on this topic. Uh, from a personal standpoint, I would, I would try to think about how to protect myself in a couple different ways. If I make myself invisible, it's kind of hard to hack me. That makes sense, right? Here's another one. Humans are bad at security. Doesn't matter if you're old. I don't care. It doesn't matter, right? You have these very sophisticated nation-state actors who spend billions of dollars on cybersecurity. Guess how they deliver most of their attacks? It's a phishing email. Why? Someone's going to click. But what are the economics of sending an email? I can send a million a day. If you could take the human out of the loop to the greatest extent possible, that's a great recipe for success, right? And there's a number of different ways you can do that. Um, the other one would be, uh, this is about risk, right? My risk profile is different from all of yours, right? But if I do the things necessary to protect myself, like for example, if I'm better than Linda, they're going to go for Linda, not me. So I don't need to be the best in the world. I still be better than Linda. Right? If I do that, right, I, can, I can do a lot of things. Right? So uh, two things I'll talk about real quick. So we talked about social media. So I had a client one time, a uh, very wealthy individual, had his account wide open. Um, and so what happened was the family was making a planning trip to Europe. So one of the nephews is like, oh my goodness, two weeks to Paris, I can't wait, one week down, we're leaving in two days, we're on the plane, we're taking off, and someone says, I want to, I think it's a good time to rob you, right? And that's exactly what happened, right? Someone went to their home and robbed. Um, another one was, had, a, had another individual who had some pretty significant financial theft occur, and started looking, you know, sometimes we would provide assistance to different clients for different reasons, Start looking into this, and start looking at the social media accounts because it's, it's, it's a great source of intelligence gathering, right? To help figure out your name, who you're linked to, et cetera. And had a weak password. Password was a dog's name. By the way, if your password is a dog's name, obviously you can change that. Uh -oh. just, for, just for advice or anything like that. Um, password was a dog's name. And he's like, okay, yeah, but how would they know that on my account? I never put my dog's name on my account. Yeah, but if you clicked on the account and you looked at, you know, some little girl's name Sally, right? Guess what she had? Picture of the dog, you her arm around the dog with the dog's name, etc. And we really thought that was probably one of the ways that this this the financial theft occurred, right? And if this client had really just clicked the section, the part of, the, of that social media account that says only share with friends and family, that probably wouldn't have happened. One of the things that Linda talked about was finding her information in the dark web. So I have a friend who's named Scott. Um, his, remember when the Target hack happened a few years ago? Everyone, everyone remembers that. It was a pretty seminal event in Cyberland. Um, when that occurred, right, Target, being the reputable company it is, sent him a letter, said, Scott, you've probably heard about what happened, right? Your account was one of the ones that, that was leaked to the, to the hackers, right? And they recommended a number of different things. Now, Scott has had that same email address for the last 20 years, right? So what do you think he did with that account when Target sent him that note? He knows his email address is in the hands of hackers, and he did. He did change the password, but he didn't do anything with the account, right? So that account, that email address is still in their hands. They know who it's identified with. They can still identify it to him, right? So what we recommend is everyone's just set up separate identities via email, right? So I have my email address. I only use it for friends and family. I only use it for my loved ones. I don't have any tax information in it. Right? I don't have any other sensitive or, or, or any other sensitive information in it, right? I keep that one alone. When I log into everything else, I keep up these different identities. So for example, make it up. But just think about it. In 2016, there were a billion identities were stolen. Last year, 27, or 2016 was like half a billion, and 2017 was a billion. Then there was like Yahoo was just 500 million. What do you think the chances are someone in this, everyone in this room is going to lose some form of identity in the next three to five years? Raise your hand. Might be lucky, but probably not, right? So it's probably going to be all of, all, of, all of us, right? So when Scott receives that letter, if he was logging into Target and these other ones with a, a, a fictitious email account, that, well, not fictitious, but an email account that's not identifiable to him, right? Target sends him that note. What does he do? He gets rid of it. He doesn't care about it. Yeah. It means nothing to him, right? It doesn't have any sensitive information. It's a disposable identity. You should do that for every site you log into, all your financial accounts, everything else. And that's really how you start thinking about it. How do I keep myself invisible? How do I flex with what's going on in the world? How do I take the human out of the loop? 
that's really a great way to think about cyber, the cyber world. Maybe they need to do that. The mortality um, rate for elder financial abuse is actually really high. Um, I, I thought when I headed the elder abuse prosecution unit that um, probably cases involving physical abuse uh, domestic violence. There are a lot of domestic violence cases involving older family members with kids or grandkids. Um, often there's drugs involved or controlled substances who end up beating their parents for money. Um, and I thought that probably had the highest mortality rate. But in, in actuality, um, elder financial abuse has the lowest survival rate. Uh, lower, a lower survival rate than domestic violence and physical abuse cases. This is research done by the University of Texas and the Department of Justice. It's tied with caregiver neglect. And this probably explains why um, I had a policy when I ran the elder abuse prosecution unit that the ADAs in my unit, 18 of them, should meet every older victim, even if the victim suffered from some form of dementia. You know I met your grandmother. She couldn't talk to me. Not to scare them, but to meet them. I thought that was important. And I would say at least half the time, the assistant DAs did not get to meet the victims because the victims had passed away after they were informed about the elder financial abuse. So many family members told me that they, they lost the world live. Um, and I believed it. You know, doctors verified this also. So we, we had, I remember one lawyer who was working in his, he was 90, he had made it through four heart attacks um, but when he was exploited by a caregiver who had been with him for almost 15 years, we never got to meet him. When he found out, he died shortly thereafter. So it was a serious problem.